I have the great pleasure of introducing a friend, as well as one of the, the most prominent figures in the community, uh, Sujin Kwan. Sujin is the managing director of the MBA admissions and the overall program at Michigan's Ross School of Business. She's also an adjunct lecturer in business communications at Ross. Previous in her life, she was also a manager at Deloitte Consulting, an analyst with the U.S. Senate Budget Committee, and a Presidential Management Fellow with the White House Appropriations Committee and Department of Commerce. She holds an MBA from Ross, a Master's in Public Policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a BA in Economics and Political Science from Yale. She's clearly not very accomplished. Um, we're <laughs> thrilled to have Sujin here to share perspective on her career, her path, and then a little bit about what's happening in the MBA world for all of you. So Sujin, welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. When um, Devang and, and Angel asked me to do this, I was thrilled. And, and the context they gave me was there are a lot of Googlers out there who are interested in thinking about the next step in their career. And we thought it might be useful for you to share your own path. And so I'm going to start from way back from when I was a child and when all of us start to think about, what do you want to do when you grow up? How many of you have thought about that question since childhood? <laughs> right? So when I was really young, before I went to grade school, I thought, I want to be a cashier because I thought you got to take home all the money that you collected at the end of the day. And then I got a little bit older, I got a little bit wiser, and I saw my parents working really hard. My parents are immigrants from Korea. And my dad was an engineer, and my mom worked at nights fixing phones um, so she could be home while we were home from school. And they were constantly working and taking care of us around the clock. And I thought, wow, that is hard. All I want to do when I grow up is retire. <laughs> My parents said, no, you got to first work. So then as I went through grade school and middle school, I was one of a handful of Asian kids in a very white community right outside of Ann Arbor, actually. And I grew up with a lot of physical and personal challenges to who I was because of how I looked. And right or wrong, I happened to watch the movie The Godfather with my dad when I was young. And I thought, when I grow up, I want to be the godfather. Because you can say, take a hit out on that person. They've crossed me. <laughs> and my parents said, Sujin, no, that's not the way to get ahead. So then when I got to high school, what I saw was still my parents working really hard and trying to make ends meet. And our ends met. But we had things that we needed, not always the things that I wanted. And I thought, what I want, back to my childhood, is money. I need to go work in business. So um, I, I also grew up playing the piano quite well a long time ago. And I had a decision to make when I got into college. I'd gotten into Michigan for music and gotten a scholarship to study music. But I also got into Yale, not for music, but for a liberal arts education. And I chose the win-win solution, which was to go to Yale. Because my parents are Asian. They have a desire to have bragging rights. <laughs> and Yale gave them bragging rights with all their friends um, that, that we grew up with. And for me, it was a ticket out of Michigan, and a ticket to seeing more of the world, l learning with other people who are not from Michigan. And that really appealed to me. So I thought, finally, I'll be free. I can do whatever I want to do, except that my parents said, well, you got to do something that's going to get you a job. And the thing that's going to get you a job is a degree that's going to lead to either another degree or business. So you're either going to do pre-med or engineering or pre-law, something like that. I didn't want to do any of those things. But they said, if you want us to pay for college, or at least part of it, you're going to have to major in something that gets you a job. So. My compromise was economics and political science. I thought that's going to set me up to potentially apply to law school, because that will lead to a profession, something that my parents could say, Sujin is now a lawyer or a doctor or engineer. So it was something very clear. And it was something that was familiar. It's something that I learned about on TV. Back then, before there was Google, back before there was internet and LinkedIn, the only way you could know what career paths were available were by the people around you, your parents, their family and friends, and things you saw on TV. So to give you another example, my husband is a dentist. 
And he knew he wanted to be a dentist from a young age because he saw the show Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> How could that have led to wanting to be a dentist? There is a character on there. How many of you have seen Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? OK. So there are a bunch of elves. And there's one elf, Hermie, who says, I want to be a dentist. And the head elf says, no, you're a toy maker. He says, but I'm really interested in molars and things. And so when he saw that, my husband Jim said, I want to do something that makes me different, too. The other thing that made him realize he wanted to be a dentist was growing up, he had gone to his dentist. And he was always singing and whistling. And this guy was always happy. And he thought, when I grow up, I want a career where I'm really happy and, and fulfilled in my career. So that's what I want to do. Even though we ended up in very different places, what drove us to our decision was that we were influenced by the things that we knew, the people around us, what we were exposed to. And back before the internet, it was really limited. So most people followed in the footsteps of their parents or their parents' friends. So fast forward to college in my senior year uh, at Yale, I had to decide what am I going to do next. The obvious thing was to go to law school. So to make my parents happy and be a good Asian kid, I did apply to law school. But what I really wanted to do after taking a constitutional law class was work on policies that would impact a lot of people for the greater good. And I discovered in the career office at Yale, public policy school. And so I sent away for information for that, not telling my parents that I was doing that. And I got in. And when it came time to make a decision, my parents said, what the heck is this thing called an MPP? What are you going to do when you grow up after getting that degree? Does it lead to a job? And how much will you make? I said, I don't know. I'm just going to take it on faith that it will work out. And so it did. I did get a job. I became a presidential management fellow. And what that program does is it gives you leadership training as well as rotational opportunities throughout the executive and legislative branches. And that's what I did for a number of years. And it was great fun to be in the middle of what was making news. It's still making news. Stuff that happens in DC makes the news. It felt exciting. It felt current. It felt sexy. Until I realized I am just one little cog in this big machine that isn't having an impact on things that really change the world. And so I felt pretty useless. And I thought, I need to do something else, because my heart is, isn't really in it. It was in it for the right reasons, but I wasn't feeling like I could have that impact. So the next step was private sector. At least there, I can feel like I'm working on something where I can impact change pretty quickly, where I can see the results of my brain power, my effort, my working with other people. So I said, consulting, that's a thing for me. It'll allow me to use my brain power. It'll allow me to work with different people, work on different projects. It'll be exciting. It'll be sexy. We're all in search of sexy to some extent. Um, so I threw a bunch of letters out there, cover letters to all the top consulting firms. I got nothing. I thought, I have a Yale degree and a Harvard degree. Surely that's going to get me a job. Guess what? It doesn't. It didn't because I didn't know how to apply for a job like that. I didn't really know what it was. I didn't know how to talk about what I would bring to the table. I didn't know how to talk about their organizations. I hadn't done my homework, and I didn't really know myself. So I went back to the drawing board. The answer is always school. When you don't know what to do next, <laughs> school is always a good thing. So I decided to get my MBA, because I still had it in my mind that I wanted to do consulting. I went to the Michigan Ross School of Business right here in Ann Arbor and spent the next two years doing things that would set me up to be able to get a consulting job. And I did. I landed a job at Deloitte Consulting. And I did that for about five years. And it gave me some of the things that I was looking for, which was using my brain power to make change in an organization that I could see. But after a number of years of doing that, again, I felt my heart saying, I need something more. So I had to think about, what is that more that I'm looking for? And that more was personal meaning, where I'm having an impact on something that makes somebody else's life better, where it's getting someone more opportunities. That's about all I knew about what I wanted to do next. And so I had to really think about, what are the jobs out there that could give me that, where I can use my skills and get the, the kind of 
the feeling that I want in my, in my gut, in my soul, about having impact. So I just started talking to a lot of people, people who do different things in their careers and learning, what do they do? What is it all about? And as it turns out, one of my conversations was with the woman who had recruited me to come work at Deloitte. She was a manager at the time, and as soon as I took the offer, she said, guess what, Sujin, I'm leaving. I'm so glad you signed. You made me look good, but I'm going to go do something else. I was like, what the heck? I joined because I wanted to work with you. As it turned out, she went to go be the admissions director at the Ross School of Business. And over the next five years that I worked at Deloitte, I kept in touch with her. And having those conversations with her helped lead me to my current job at the Ross School of Business. We talked about, what do I like doing? What is it about some of the roles that I've had that really excited me, brought me joy, made me feel like I was having the kind of impact that I wanted? And it was a number of things. One was, in my free time, I am an alumni interviewer for Yale undergrad. And one of the things I love about that is understanding people, what motivates them, their dreams, and is there a good fit between what they want to do, what they've done, and what that school can offer. So that was one thing. Another thing I realized was at Deloitte, I really enjoyed recruiting new MBAs because it was an avenue to opportunities. It was promoting an organization that I really loved. And then I also liked using my analytical skills in consulting, figuring out how do I make something work better? How do I get more of something? How do I make it as good a process and experience for people who engage with my organization, whether it's Deloitte or Yale or Michigan? How do I make those things happen? And so when I described these things to her, it became obvious to her and to me that recruiting at Michigan might be a good fit. An opportunity happened to present itself. She had an open slot there. That's how I got here 13 years ago. And I haven't looked back because the things that keep me here are some of the same things I was looking for in a job. Feeling like I have an impact on people's lives and that help them have better opportunities in their own lives. Getting to use my analytical skills, the things that I learned in the MBA program. And working in an organization that I feel is mission driven and helps other people and is doing really exciting things. It's sexy to work on leadership and innovation and entrepreneurship and all those things. And I'm surrounded by faculty, students, and alumni who do that. And so when people ask me what's next, I say, why should there be a what's next if I'm learning and I'm growing and I love what I do? Because ultimately, isn't that what we're looking for? At least one of those three things. But if you have all three of those things, you kind of have that trifecta. So as I think about advice to people who are early in their career, how can you find the thing that will make your heart sing? I have a few things. One is to research and explore. Really talk to a lot of people. Every person that you meet is going to be able to teach you something. I met Devon maybe seven, eight years ago. Not professionally, but through an alumni of event. We were planting flowers. We planted flowers together. Yeah. He and his wife in downtown Ann Arbor. We were all doing volunteer work that day and we happened to develop a relationship that over the last seven years I've watched him have two kids. He's seen my kids grow up. I'm here now largely because of him. And meeting Angel. Are you still in here Angel? I met her at Devong's house and we had a great conversation about some of the things that she did in undergrad that I was really inspired about her initiative and her drive for creating a TED Talk series at her institution. I was really excited to hear things that people do, and it makes me want to know them and know other people. The other thing, second thing, is to reflect on what's important to you and where you are in your life. What's right for you really depends on where you are in your stage of life. Who's in your life? Who do you need to take care of? Do you have a significant other? Do you have children? Do you have parents who need to be taken care of? Or can you right now focus on yourself? That should influence the choices that you make. And the other thing is, what do you need to do in your life right now? 
Do you have a lot of other obligations? Do you have personal goals that you want to fit in? Or can you really focus on career? Those things can help you figure out what is the next career for me? Because at different times in your life, those things are going to change. And the last thing I would encourage you to do is to stop and reflect. Reflect on what have I done so far in my life? What have I learned? With the people that I've talked to, what seems really interesting? How did they get there? What can I learn from them or about how to get there? And if you don't do this already, I would encourage you to keep a journal. And I know it can be hard. I find it hard myself. But keep a journal of the things that you learn about yourself, of the things that were hard, how you've tackled some of those problems, things you want to change about how you might approach something, goals that you have. But taking quiet time to sit down and reflect about those things, that can help you also narrow down what, what it is you want to do. You guys are really lucky that you work in a great place, that you live in a time when you can find out information about anything, about anyone, anywhere in the world, and you can connect with them. You are only a few degrees of separation away from someone you may want to meet. In some ways, that might be harder, because that makes it seem overwhelming, all those opportunities that you could have. But if you do, do those three things that I suggested, research and talk to people, think about where you are in your life right now, and sitting down and reflecting on what's important to you, what you've done, and who you want to be, that can help narrow your focus a bit. One of the most exciting things about meeting new people for me is thinking about new ways of doing things and new ways, new things to do. And some people may call that networking. I really call it getting to know people. It's a really valuable skill. And I have to put in a plug, of course, for getting an MBA. <laughs> and here's why. Because I will contend that more than any other degree, that's going to open up a broader range of opportunities. It can be opportunities financially, opportunities industry, function-wise, opportunities to meet different people. If you are a dentist, or a doctor, or an attorney, your career is that. It will be almost invariably that for the rest of your life. But when you get an MBA, there are so many things you can do that may or may not be related to business. What it teaches you are ways to think about things, problem solve, and to work with other people. And that's what you're going to have to do in any field. And so I contend that an MBA is the most valuable degree, the most flexible degree you can have out there. And if you're going to do one, you should get it at Michigan. <laughs> I'll stop there and turn it over to Devon. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's incredibly insightful to hear about your journey, more insightful to hear about how you've made decisions at every stage in your life. I'll start with a handful of questions. And as I'm asking questions, I'll ask all the folks in the room to also start thinking about questions or jotting them down. Um, but let's start. With, one of the things that really struck me is how you made decisions at every stage in your life based on a little bit of something that felt uneasy, something in your gut, something that meant that you needed to think about this itch that was kind of happening and like a change that you needed. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about how you thought about those decisions and then ultimately any sort of guidance. A lot of the folks in this room are either in their first job or their second job out of school and will soon be coming to those points of inflection. So any guidance you can provide there would be useful. So there were many things that made making these decisions challenging for me along the way. Part of it is my own culture and heritage, wanting to, being Asian, obviously, wanting to please my parents and make them proud. That is something that even now, as I'm approaching 50, is, it looms really large in my head, the decisions that I make. And so what I wanted to do wasn't always what they wanted me to do. And reconciling that was really hard. The other was reconciling kind of my background and what I want to do. Is this the career path of someone who went to Yale and Harvard to be an admissions director? Who grows up wanting to do that? <laughs> Getting an MBA and then being an admissions director eventually? Who grows up wanting to do that? 
So it felt like a very non-traditional, unconventional decision to make. And I'll be honest, I have a lot of pride. Like, I want people to say, wow, she's done something really great with her life. She is accomplishing a lot. And given the path that I was on, it wasn't always clear to me that the choice that I've made in this role was an obvious one. It takes a lot of courage to say, but you know what? I love this. I'm learning. I'm contributing. I'm making an impact. I can make change. And I'm meeting really great people. It took a lot of courage for me to say those things outweigh all the other image-related things that I was so, so uh, mired in. Um, and probably at a younger age, it's harder to do that, because you feel like there are things that you need to do, maybe things that you need to prove either to your family or to your friends or to yourself. But at the end of the day, what I've come to conclude, and I can because I'm further in my career now, is unless it's really making you thrive, unless you feel like my heart is singing doing this, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm doing things that matter to me, then you're just spinning wheels. Then it's just a job. And nobody wants to have just a job. You want to have something that makes you get up and say, I can't wait to do this again. I love the people I work with. I love the things that I get to do. I can't wait to do more of this. And when you stop doing that, when you stop learning, when you stop growing, and when you stop being able to feel like you're contributing, that's the time to rethink what's the next thing. Thanks, Eugene. One more question along the same lines. As, as the folks in this room are thinking about their next steps, I think often in the conversations I've had and, and that I've heard happening, there's this almost conflict of, do I pursue something I'm really passionate about versus going to get an MBA and what role they both play? How would you guide the folks in this room to think about that conflict? I guess it comes down to a timing thing, right? If they think an MBA is in your future, when is the right time to do it? There really isn't a wrong time, because now there are so many different times in your career that you can get it. The standard path is with the full-time MBA, coming out of, bis out of undergrad, working for a number of years, and then going back to get your, your MBA before you're 30. There are also programs like at Ross where you can do it part-time while you're working full-time. And then there are programs like at Ross where you can get it when you've been working for 10 or more years as an executive MBA. And it's at a different level that you'll get it. So there's never a wrong time. If you have a great professional opportunity, don't give it up. If you feel like you're continuing to do something where you're learning and you're growing, and if you took yourself off that path to go get an MBA at that point, then wait a year. But if you feel like there are skills that I can gain now that only the MBA could provide and my current job can't, that might be the right time to get it as well. Thanks. Uh, it's a good transition to thinking about like MBAs in general. How would you describe Ross and, and what you think makes Ross unique? One of the things that attracted me to Ross almost 20 years ago and still holds true today is that it's really focused on allowing you to do things hands-on, not just sitting in class and learning about theories and applying frameworks to simulations, but really getting out and doing things that you might want to do, whether it's consulting or managing a fund or starting up a business. All of those things you can do at Ross while you're a student with faculty and alumni advisors with resources that are not yours that you're putting at risk, with the help of classmates who have done some of the things that you may want to do. And so it's an incredible place where if you want to actually do things and not just learn the theory behind it, you'll get that too. There's no better place to do that than at Ross. Thanks. And when you think about the role of an MBA in context of a person's career path or life path, how has that changed over the last 10 or 20 years? I'd say it's changed quite a bit. If you look at the industries that students go into, the recruiters that come to campus, the choices that student make, students make about their careers post-MBA, it's just exploded. 25 years ago, people used to take pretty standard paths, banking, marketing, consulting. 
those were really the three buckets that people went into. Now people are doing all kinds of things. They're starting up their own businesses. There are so many different kinds of tech jobs, as you guys know. Um, there are still students who go into consulting and finance and marketing, but those are not as big as they used to be, and it's no longer a career for life as so many people who got MBAs back in the day used to be. It's you do one thing for a few years, and then you may pivot your career in any, any number of ways. And the beauty of the MBA now is it's giving you the skills and the access to pivot your career multiple times, which students now are going to be doing much more than even students from my generation. So I, I think that's one observation I have. You, I've been in the workforce for 20 years, and, and when I started, candidly, I would think getting a job meant a job for life, right? And now people are changing careers quite frequently, probably five to 10 times over the course of their, their entire careers. What advice do you have in context of careers and when people are thinking about making those switches? The, the advice I'd give is to learn from every role that you have. Learn not just the skills that are uh, required for the position that you're in, but also learn about yourself. What motivates you? What about that particular role at that time really interested you? So that you can get closer to what it is that's going to make be your nirvana. And it may change over time, too. Um, I never knew that I would love speaking as much as I do, frankly. Um, it used to scare the heck out of me. And you could never get me to be the person to stand in front of a class or a large group to, to volunteer to speak. And now, through this role, because I had to, because I've done it quite a bit, and because I enjoy um, sharing what I know, I've learned that I love something that I never would have imagined that I love. So it's exposing yourself to different things and getting good at everything, even if you don't love it, because you may find eventually you do love it, and that's the thing that makes you say, this is so fun. I can't wait to do it again. So in your role, um, you obviously shape both admissions and what the class looks like, and you also shape what the program looks like. I'd love to hear from your perspective, what are some of the biggest mistakes applicants make? And then also in context of students who are actually pursuing and already in the program, what are those mistakes? What are the things people should be looking out for? I think the biggest mistakes both as an applicant and as a student are quite the same. It's inauthenticity. It's trying to be someone that you're not. Trying to make yourself at the applicant stage look like the quintessential MBA applicant rather than really just talking about yourself as you are and what you want to do. These days, unlike 20 or more years ago, there is no cookie cutter. There is no traditional MBA candidate. They are so different. We have people coming from the Peace Corps and from Teach for America and from the military, um, from nonprofits, from medicine. This wasn't standard when 20, 30 years ago, we, um, my classmates and before me were going to school. I was a non-traditional student going to business school at that time. Most of my classmates had come from some kind of business role. I came from Capitol Hill. I felt like a fish out of water. But that's not uncommon anymore. Students are coming with really different backgrounds, yet a lot of applicants think they have to look like the perfect business school applicant. Same thing for when students are in the program. They get sucked into the, oh, I should do consulting because everybody else is doing consulting, or I should do finance because everybody else is doing finance. Business school is an opportunity to learn what's out there and to learn what really motivates you, and then really jumping into learning those things. So you shouldn't have to feel like you need to be this quintessential MBA student either, or post-MBA. You don't need to do the career paths that all of your classmates are doing. The, the beauty of the degree is it's giving you options to do different things. And so I would encourage you guys to have the courage to do really different things. Thank you. Uh, one more question about the program and the class. How are you thinking about creating a diverse environment, both from a perspective of the content, but also the program makeup and the students, and creating an environment that's inclusive? I can't tell you how important diversity is to us, to me personally. Um, this year, I'm really proud that our women numbers are 
at a record high at 43% in the MBA class. I would love that to be 50-50, more in line with what you see at the undergrad level. Um, we truly believe that without a diverse uh, class, you're not going to learn as much. Without people from different backgrounds, with different experiences who are going to make you think about things in a different way, you're just going to be thinking the same way that you were before. And the whole point of school is to learn different ways of thinking about things. It's about how your mind works and how you approach situations and problems. And if everyone comes from the same industry or the same life circumstances, you're not going to grow. Our job is to give you an environment where you are going to grow the most, and that is in large part through the classmates that you have. So we are so focused on making sure that the, the student body looks very diverse, not just in terms of gender, but color, nationality, backgrounds, geographies, career goals, all those things matter because we want you to learn from people who are different from you. That's great. Last question. This is one to be a little more playful and fun. You're applying for an MBA program. Yes, I, I told you and I'm holding to it. You're applying to an MBA program. You can't apply to Ross. What other program do you apply to? God. <laughs> OK, I will give a nod to you just because he's the, the co-host here. Devon went to Yale School of Management, um, and that's my undergrad, so it does have a special place in my heart, and that's how I got to meet him. Um, but I'm not endorsing it. Um, I'll tell you where we have the most overlaps uh, in applications, because we have visibility into that from GMAT test takers, and that is we overlap largely with Kellogg, with Duke, with Wharton, Berkeley, Yale, Tuck, all of those are great schools. The thing is, any of those schools are going to be great. It's about you making the most of the opportunities that you have wherever you are. But of course, I'm, I'm pretty partial to Michigan. Uh, the student body and the, the um, opportunity to do action-based learning, it's really different from all the other schools, in my opinion. But I encourage you to check it out yourself. If you're thinking about business school, talk to students, talk to alums in every school that you're considering. Go visit, because you're going to get a feel for the school and for the vibe there. Because that's going to make the difference between whether you get an MBA or you have this great springboard for ideas and, and um, opportunities. So it's about finding the right place for you. And you'll hear every admissions director say that. Thank you for the authentic answer. <laughs> And it is very true. I think your perspective on, you know, when you make that decision to go pursue a degree, it's not just about the MBA. It's about changing the way you think, and it can have a profound impact. So thank you.